Good morning. Welcome once again. My name is Craig. I'm the senior pastor here, and it is our distinct privilege to have you with us. Thank you for taking your Sunday morning to gather with us. If you have your Bible, we are going to be in the book of Acts, and today we jump back into the book of Acts. Uh, if you were with us throughout last year, you know that we spent a significant portion of last year in the book of Acts. We're back in Acts beginning today. It will carry us into the summer. We'll take a little bit of a break in the summer months and then jump back into Acts and hopefully finish the book of Acts before the end of the year. Uh, so the focus uh, for the sermons that we will be preaching in the coming weeks uh, is, is they went preaching. And what we're going to see over and over and over again in the book of Acts, there's so much else that happens that we can sort of lose sight of the fact that more than anything else, they proclaimed the Word of God over and over and over again. So this morning we're in Acts chapter 14. Go ahead and start turning there. If you don't know where that is, you can look in the table of contents in your Bible and help you find it. But it's in the New Testament. It's the fifth book in the New Testament. Sixth book, fifth book in the New Testament. I can't count. Yeah, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. So that's five, right? Good deal. Uh, a couple of announcements while you're turning. Number one, uh, we have exceeded our building fund goal. Uh, great job. You should clap. All right. So as of this morning, as of this morning, before I walked in here, we are $5,300 away from completely paying off the building debt for this building. Uh, yeah, that's also great. Uh, I feel confident that uh, when our budget finance committee meets tomorrow, they'll recommend paying the remaining out of the budget. However, you can still give to our building fund today. If some of you would like to do that today and help us to go ahead and get that taken care of and that debt canceled, uh, please feel free to do so. But y'all, this is an incredible blessing uh, for us to be able to have that debt paid off and behind us. So we need to celebrate that. And some point in the uh, coming weeks, we'll, we will, we'll, do, we'll do it right. We'll bring the, the note in here and we'll set it on fire. I love fire anyway, so it'll be great. We'll burn it all to the ground. Uh, and it'll be a wonderful day. So uh, thank you so much for your faithfulness in giving. Um, and, uh, and, and now, you know, we, we, we put that debt behind us and we continue to move forward as God has, uh, has compelled us and called us forward. But what an incredible blessing. So just celebrate that. I'm so excited. The second thing, um, uh, equipping studies start in a couple of weeks. If you don't know what those are, you can go to look at our website and uh, find out information about those Sunday night, short-term, small group Bible studies. I'd love for you to be a part of those so you can find out all the information on our website. I hope that you will do that. All right, Acts chapter 14. We're going to begin in verse 1, and we're going to read through verse 7. All right, I'm going to ask you to stand with me in honor of God's Word. Hear now, for this is the Word of the Lord. Now at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided, some sided with the Jews and some of the apostles, when an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them. They learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia and to the surrounding country, and there they continue to preach the gospel. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that as we hear this word preached, that our lives will be changed. Father God, may we be impressed evermore of the necessity of proclaiming your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Last week I preached on money. Today I'm preaching on preaching. In case you were curious, they're both two difficult subjects for us to talk about. People get all up in their feelings when I talk about money, and we talk about preaching. I'm basically going to stand in front of you and tell you that you ought to pay me attention. So that seems a little bit self-serving all at the same time, right? So the first week I tell you to pay my salary, and the second week I tell you to pay attention. And we go, oh, what is going on? Well, I, want to know, I want you to know this morning there's a lot more going on here than me standing up in front of you and telling you to pay me attention. When we talk about the value and the necessity and the importance of preaching, the book of Acts is just a book of preaching over and over and over again. Nobody ever told you that because preaching is boring and signs and wonders are exciting. And so we tend to focus on the things that grab our attention. But the reality is that God is working the ordinary, relatively boring and mundane things of our life to bring about the changes that we need to experience and see. And there's nothing that God works more powerfully through on a consistent basis than the proclamation of the Word of God. So as we come together and think about what a sermon is, I, I do want to say to you that one of the most challenging things about crafting a sermon is that I don't get to talk to you and tell you about all the things that I want to say. 
I've got an incredible story that I want to share this morning, but if I do, it's going to add 10 minutes to the sermon. Right? The most important part of sermon preparation, believe it or not, is the editing process. And the best way to determine a good sermon, some people have said, is to determine exactly how large that editing pile is. In other words, how hard are you willing to work to cut out the things that don't necessarily fit? That's one part. Comedian George Burns once said the secret of a good sermon is to have a good beginning and a good ending. And to have the two together, as close together as possible. I'm preaching on preaching, and many of you can begin to believe that this sermon doesn't apply to you. Well, if you're going to talk about preaching, why don't you just sit around and talk with a bunch of pastors? Well, I do that every opportunity I get, but Robert Smith Jr. says this. He says, parishioners and proclaimers belong together. Preachers preach so that the church might preach the pastor's message throughout the week in the barbershop, the beauty shop, and beyond. See, this sermon matters for you because you are a preacher as well. Preaching is proclamation. And evangelism and ministry are proclamation. And so you have a responsibility to take the preached word that you experience on a Sunday morning and to carry that word beyond the walls of your church into the highways and the byways and the beauty shops and the beauty parlors and the barber shops and the restaurants and the workplaces and the schoolhouses and all the places where God might give you the ability to be present and to be influential toward other people. So this morning there are three points that I'd like to speak to you about from this passage of Scripture. The first thing I want to emphasize is that when we preach, we are to preach to be understood. Preach to be understood. And in Acts 14, 1, it says, Now at Iconium they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and believes, Jews and Greeks believed. They spoke in such a way. What way was that? Well, it was the kind of way that was necessary for both Jews and Greeks to believe. It might mean that what they did is they spoke in a common language. Maybe it means that they didn't speak in Hebrew so that the Greeks wouldn't feel left out. Maybe that's what it means. Maybe it means that they spoke slowly. Maybe it means they used appropriate language or words. Maybe it means that when they walked into the synagogue, they didn't walk in and speak using idioms that would only appeal to the, to the, to the Hebrew listeners and that they ignored the Greeks or they didn't walk in and speak in, in idioms that would only appeal to the Greeks and sort of cut off all of the Hebrew or Jewish listeners. But listen, when you share the gospel... Do you share the gospel or, or preach just to check it off your list? Or do you seek to communicate with others in such a way that they might actually understand what you're saying and make application of it in their lives? So in, in our personal public preaching and our public proclamation, we've got to find a way to speak in such a way that those to whom we are speaking can understand what we're saying. How many of y'all have ever had an argument? Like with your spouse? You don't have to raise your hand. I know you have. Well, some of y'all call it like a disagreement or a conversation. Um, I just like to be honest about it. We had a disagreement and it was an argument. Now, um, and, and it, let me just, sometimes I like to give y'all things that I, I feel like y'all need to hear. And I'm, I'm being dead serious about this. So we're not being funny. It's okay for you to have disagreements with your spouse. Here are the things that are off limits. Screaming name-calling, and accusations. I feel like I, 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 it breaks my heart that I have to say that, but I have counseled with too many Christian couples who would never dream of using foul language to call out somebody else around their life, but somehow or other it makes its way into the arguments in their home. Please don't do that. <coughs> Please do not do that. You've got to make certain. But anyway, back to the sermon. That was, that was free. You take that home. But I'm, I'm being honest with you. This matters so much. But how, how often have you found yourself in the middle of an argument and suddenly you realize that you, you really weren't concerned about whether or not you were being understood. You were just, you were just looking for a fight. Y'all ever been there? Some of y'all are better than me and you haven't been. But at some point you find yourself going, wait a minute. Is there really an issue here or is my heart the problem? Am I the issue? And in those moments, you're not even trying to be understood. You're just trying to get your point out there, and you don't care if they hear it or not because you just want to feel better. Sometimes, even in our gospel proclamation, we've stopped asking the question of whether or not what we're saying is being understood. We're just sort of checking the box. 
Well, I said it. If they didn't get it, that's their fault. That's their problem. Listen, a sermon is only effective if it can be understood and applied. A sermon is only effective if it can be understood and applied. Maybe I should say it's only effective when it can be. Because if those things can't happen, I'm not even sure we should call it a sermon. You may have had a lecture. You may have had a conversation. But if the sermon can't be understood and applied, it's really not a sermon. Big words are not necessarily good or necessary for a sermon. You don't have to explain the Greek or the Hebrew. though. If it's helpful, by all means, do it. You know, when we get to those places in, in the Greek language, for instance, uses different kinds of words for love, it's, it's sometimes helpful for us to parse those things out, but sometimes it just doesn't matter. It's not necessary. Sometimes we just use those things to make ourselves look smarter, right? Don't do that. Paul says, I'm willing to be seen as foolish if in that the cross of Christ is furthered, if the gospel is carried forward. One of my favorite books on preaching is by a guy named Mike Fabrez. It's called Preaching That Changes Lives. And that should really be the goal of every single sermon. Every sermon should have the goal not to make me look smart or to make y'all walk out the door and slap me on the back and say, boy, that was a good one, pastor. By the way, you can do that. It's okay. I'm, I'm good with that. Um, but the goal should be that lives are changed. That lives are changed. That you leave different from an encounter with the Word of God. Now, that's not just a preaching sermon on Sunday morning. The same goal should be for you when you share the gospel with somebody in your workplace or a family member. That every time that you speak with them about the Word of God, that there's a little bit of a change that comes about in their life. That's the goal that we have because God's Word is powerful. So a sermon's only effective if it can be understood and applied. I also want to point out that the responsibility for understanding begins with the preacher, but it does not end there. Let me explain what I mean. That means that I should not walk into a sermon and use $50 words when $2 words will work. Okay? Um, and, and that's especially true. I've got to be aware of the audience I preach to. I preached to a bunch of teenagers on, um, what night was that? on Wednesday night. right? When I'm preaching to teenagers, I've got to be aware. Now, look, I love ours. we got a great group. They, they, they've learned to be preached to. They're a great group to preach to. Um, they, they take notes. They engage. They listen well. But a lot of students aren't the same way. I've got to make sure I'm, I'm aware of that. So I want to be careful about the words I use, the tone that I use, the speed with which I preach. That's something i got to work hard on because I get, get real excited and start moving real quick. And y'all can't keep up. Y'all don't even know what I said because it's going so fast. i got to slow down. So it begins there. But watch, it doesn't end there. If you've been a Christian for more than about 45 minutes, then you bear some responsibility as a follower of Jesus to do all that you can to grow in your understanding of God's Word and your ability to understand and interact with good preaching. Do you, do you know that? That when you show up on Sunday morning, you need to be prepared when you walk in the door? That you need to be doing all you can to make sure that you can understand and apply the Word of God? When you get here, how might you do that? You say, well, isn't that your responsibility? Well, it's at least half my responsibility. It might be more than that. But some of this comes on you, right? How? What if you were to pray? How many of y'all pray on Saturday nights before you go to bed? Lord God, prepare my heart for worship in the morning. It's amazing how the Lord answers those prayers. How many of you, how many of you study to get ready for the message? How many of you are studying the Word of God enough so that when somebody's preaching to you, it's amazing how when you're spending your own time in personal Bible study and in your own quiet times and devotions, as you're studying the Word of God, it's incredible the way that the God line, the, the God, the way that God lines some things up so that things you're experiencing in your personal life tends to run, run right into intersection with the things that's being preached to you on a regular basis. So there's the studying aspect, and then there's just the preparation aspect. If you know that I'm going to be preaching out of the book of Acts this week, I mean, look, here's the cool thing about being a part of Malvern Hill. Okay, next week, I'm going to preach out of Acts, and here's where I'm going to be, the next verses. Pastor Kevin's going to preach in a few weeks, and when he preaches, he's going to preach the next verses that are coming after that. You're going to go, you are doing that, right? I didn't, okay, I just want to make sure. <laughs> Throw me a curveball here. Anyway, um, but you're, you, as, you're, as you're preparing for worship, you can actually sit down on Saturday night or Sunday morning and say, let me read the verses that my pastor's going to be preaching from. You get and you go, man, I don't know what that word means. You might just look in the back of your Bible in the concordance and look it up so that when the pastor mentions it in the service, it makes sense in your head. You're able to make application of it because you did a little preparation. 
But there's, there's power in the word, but the, the word's got to be preached to be understood. So the first and the primary responsibility lies on the pastor. But if you are a follower of Jesus and you're attending to the preaching of the word, some of that responsibility lies on you as well. Show up prepared to hear the word. Because it's, 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 it's not enough that you just kind of sat there and it sort of blew over your head. The Word of God has to be put into action in your life. So that's the first thing. Preach to be understood. The second thing, expect great things from the preached Word. Let me read a few passages of Scripture to you. Isaiah 55, 10 through 11. It says, For as the rain and snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God says that when he sends out his word, it's going to do things. God's word is powerful to accomplish things. Um, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from its sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him who must give account. Listen, there is a power in the word of God, and it's not just in these other passages of Scripture. If you look back in Acts chapter 14, the Bible says that, so they remained for a long time, in verse 3, so they remained for a long time speaking boldly for the Lord who bore witness to the word of His grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. This is why I would argue that the preaching of the word is more central to the book of Acts than the signs and wonders that are being done. Because right here we have an explanation. Somebody says, why are these signs and wonders given? Well, let's look at God's word and see what it says. It says that the signs and wonders were given not for the purpose of grabbing attention. Now, the signs and wonders in this passage were given to give power, credibility to the preached word of God. The primary focus was the preached word of God. And the signs and wonders came along to show the people that this word is doing what it is. What it claims to do. We should expect great things from the preached word. We should expect signs and wonders from the preached word. You say, well, Craig, I don't, I don't see great powerful miracles happening. Let me tell you something. Every time the waters of baptism are stirred in this congregation, we see great powers and wonders taking place. When the Lord saves a soul from perdition, the Lord in that place saves that sinner for all of eternity. Gives them a brand new heart. There is no greater miracle that we get to experience in this life than that. God is at work. When God repairs a marriage, that's a miracle of God's hand that He does. We should expect great things from the preached Word. Now watch. I don't want you to be surprised if God meets your expectations. And here's what I mean by that. If you show up expecting God to do great things on a consistent basis, you know what you're going to discover? You're going to discover God to do something great. You're going to. How many of you wake up in the morning and you run to your quiet time and you expect that when you show up in that quiet time that God is going to do something in that time, in that place? That God's going to meet you in the reading of His Word and in your prayers? Those of you that have that expectation discover that God is right there. How many of you just don't do it and you can't figure out why you're not growing in Christ? I'm, he's meeting your expectation. You don't expect Him to show up so you don't meet with Him there and you don't experience any growth. God tends to give us what we want. If you expect a sermon to be a disappointment, guess what? It's going to be. How many of you walk in and go, here, I, that, that, that Thompson kid, we're going to go listen to that, I guess. You know, happy Sunday, right? That's what you're going to get, you know? He's going to go yell at us some more. That's, by the way, y'all got to speak to your kids, right? This is what, one of, this is what some of the kids say. Man, he, he yells a lot. It's just passion. Now, this is me talking. I'm not even yelling. You'll know when I yell. It's going to be bad. Anyway, talk to your kids or your spouse. Whoever says those things. It's not nice. It hurts my feelings. I don't even know where my feelings are. Folks, if we show up expecting little, we're going to get little. If we show up expecting a lot, it's amazing what we get. Do you know that I can tell the ones of y'all that show up not expecting a whole lot? You just kind of wander in like this. Like three minutes later, right as the sermon shows, right as the service starts, right? You just sat down, you just sit there, you're like, mm -hmm. Those of you who show up expecting something, man, you walk in looking around. Man, what God's, what's God going to do today? What's He going to do when I get there? 
Man, some of us need a high five when we come in the door. Why? Are you, what, what, what's happening? Yes, God is going to show up. He's going to show out. He's going to do something. Here's one last side note. I don't have any more for today. If you complain about the preaching and the worship service with your kids, don't be surprised if they grow up to not love the church. Let me, let me just be blunt. You don't have to like me. That's like, it's okay. I got a lot of people that do. I'm fine. You don't have to, like, if, if the preaching style and the worship style of this church, is, it doesn't fit you. And if you can't get plugged in, if the only thing you're able to do is to go home on Sunday morning and, like, look at, the, at everybody across the kitchen table or lunch or whatever and be like, and, and critique the sermon and critique the music and critique everything. Find a place where you can plug in and you can find joy so that you can then give your children a love for Christ's church. If you have a sour attitude about it, they might still show up with you, but they'll only do it until they're about 18 years old. And then when they leave, and you're not going to understand why they're wandering from the church. And folks, the reason they're wandering from the church is because what they learned from you is that the sermon doesn't matter and the worship doesn't matter and that your opinion trumps everything else. And your opinion was negative. And when they determined that the church was not objectively true or valuable, then they don't have any use for it in their own life. And then we're praying with you guys because you're like, I don't understand why my children are walking away from the church. And folks, I'm, I'm, I'm really not trying to be mean. Some of you right now are looking back on the regret of your past and you're praying earnestly for the Lord to undo some of those mistakes. And I'm praying with you. I have prayed with some of you. So if you still have children at home, let me just tell you that I could fill this stage with 60, 70, and 80-year-olds who would tell you there is great value in investing in your children a love for Christ and His Word and His church. If your children are still at home, prioritize the preaching of the word and the ministry with the saints and, and do so at the expense of everything else. Do so at the expense of everything else. All the other things that you can commit to on Sunday mornings with your children will end when they're 16 or 17 or 18 or 19 years old. All of it. These commitments last for all of eternity. Don't store up for yourself treasures on earth where rust and moth destroy, but instead store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Some of you... I don't know if I should say this with like anger or tears. Because some of you are so interested in getting your kids trophies and ribbons. Parents, let me just tell you. When they're 20 years old, the trophy they earned or the championship ring at their game... Or the crown they got in their pageant when they're 20, if that is still a source of pride for them, then what you've learned is that they haven't grown up. You don't want that. You hope that at 20 all that stuff has made it to a box in the attic. And if it has, then some of y'all are going to have to look at the boxes in the attic that are collecting dust and rust and moths. And you're going to say, I spent $20,000 for a box of rotten ribbons. And my children don't know Jesus and I've wasted it. I'm just going to say it. There are adults profiting off of other adults' desire to live vicariously through their children. What do I mean by that? Those people that are telling you how desperately you need to enroll your children in all these other extracurricular activities are making a living off of 
your decision to draw them away from the things of Christ and plug them into a commitment to the things of the world. And the world will eat them alive and moths will eat their ribbons and rust will destroy their trophies. And they may inherit a Christless eternity because their parents valued the accolades this world could give them at 20 years old or at 19 years old, or at 10 years old, rather than eternity. Don't be surprised if God meets your expectations, your goals, and your desires. It hurts my heart. I wish I could dismiss all of them and I could just talk to some of y'all grown people for a little while. Because this isn't even about my sermon. See, it hurts my heart because of how many 16-year-olds sit in my office downcast because their parents have placed expectations upon them that are worldly. And have not prioritized the desire for their children to know Jesus. Some of you will get what you want. Your kids will get scholarships. Your kids will be well known for their athletic prowess or their dance or their music or whatever it is. And you'll get that. Your kids will finally be more popular than you were in high school. And you'll feel good about that. It's... See, what you don't know that I know is that you end up with me when they're 30 with tears in your eyes going, Pastor, my children. They're raising my grandchildren and they don't know the Lord and I don't know what I've done wrong. There's still time. But I'll just be totally honest. Some of y'all need to just draw a line in the sand and say, I'm going to stop living through my children and start living for them. Some of you need to start saying no. And for those of you that are mad at me right now, I love you. But I want you to go home and pray. And I want you to read God's word. And if you can come back and show me how in God's word I'm wrong, then I will repent. But if in God's word, it says that you should not forsake the gathering together yourselves as a body of believers, as it does. And if you choose on a regular basis to forsake the gathering together yourselves as a body of believers. So that every other Sunday, or every third Sunday, you can take your kid to go and participate in some extracurricular activity. Then, then you've got to wrestle with what God's word says, not what Craig says. Well, we can be missionaries. Okay, then come talk to me because I'm going to make you this promise. If some of you feel called to missions in that particular field, we're going to commission you as missionaries in the church. But you're going to have to stand before God and everybody else and say our primary purpose for doing this is to, is to be on mission. And then we're going to find the neediest group of people we can commission you to go to. And it's not going to be focused on the most productive or the most celebrated. It's not going to matter who won the most championships or who sent out the most scholarships. We're going to say that's the most lost group of folks we could find. That's where we're going to send you. All right, let's move on. Don't be surprised if God meets your expectations. That's actually how we took that left-hand turn. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised if you meet your expectations in worship. You show up here not expecting much, then you'll leave here mad that I said that, all right? If you showed up here expecting God to do something, some of you are going to walk out of here convicted. And you're going to walk out and you go, I don't know why he said that, but I know that I needed to hear it. And some of you are going to show back up here next Sunday even though your schedule says you're supposed to be somewhere else and you're going to look at your children and you're going to say, we signed you up to do this. But the first commitment we made was to Christ. And we're going to model that before you. And just in case you were curious, I've seen some of those teenagers do that. And I've seen too many of our adults not. Yes, 
Teenagers that are sitting over there that have come and said, Pastor, I said I was going to be at this thing and I got this other thing, so I called my coach and told him I couldn't be there because I made a prior commitment here. Pastor, I've got an opportunity to do this, but they do it on Sundays. And so I had to tell them, oh, oh, and my parents, that I wouldn't do that because I decided Jesus mattered more. And shame on you if you're a parent who had to have your child look you in the face and tell you that church and Christ mattered more than their sports career or their dance or whatever it is. All right, let's move on. I moved from sad to mad. We need to get over it. All right. Don't be surprised if God meets those expectations, but watch. Prepare to be surprised when God exceeds your expectation. Now, this doesn't make a lot of sense because if you prepare to be surprised, it doesn't actually work. How many of y'all ever got like tipped off that you're walking into a surprise party and you tried to fake it? Um, I did that once. I, I, I didn't mean to. I had this weird ability to, to, to figure out like gifts and stuff. I don't even try all the time. Sometimes things just add up and I had a surprise party one time and I just like it just clicked. I, I realized it. We, we're driving there, and I was like, oh, and, 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 and just in case, side note, period, I guess this is the third one. If you figure that out, don't tell anybody, just keep it to yourself, okay? I really messed up because I was like, oh, there's going to be a surprise party. Bad decision, you know? And so, and, and then you, you're trying to fake surprise, like, oh, I didn't know. So when I say that we should not be surprised if God meets your expect or exceeds them, I, I know it's kind of crazy, but, but I'm warning you anyway. I mean, just imagine you showed up in the synagogue to hear the word preached, and then boom, they're preaching, and then there's, there's great numbers of Jews and Greeks that are believing. you got to figure that at some point Paul and Barnabas are like, I can't believe this is happening. I, I don't know what's happening here. It's, it's a little crazy. And then all of a sudden, boom, they, they're preaching, and maybe there's a sick person that walks in as they're preaching. That person gets healed, and they jump up, and they walk off, and they go, I don't know what's going on. Folks, we need to be expectant of the fact that God is bigger than our expectations, right? That he's bigger than our understanding. And sometimes he just works. And he just does. And so I just want to warn you, prepare. Prepare. So what, what do I mean? That means you don't know what he's going to do, but here's how I want you to be prepared. When he does, that you give him the glory and the praise and the honor immediately. When God does something crazy or out of the ordinary, that you just go, yes, look what he did. That the response is, praise the Lord, look what he has done. That the response is never, look at me, look what I did. No, 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 look what's happened through the proclamation of the word of God. I got a call from a pastor this week. And uh, he was asking me for a few things and, and, and about how we do some things. And I said, brother, why, why are you calling me? I, I mean, I appreciate it. I, I want to serve you. But why, why are you calling me? He said, because I know some of your people. I thought, oh, no. Uh, <laughs> you know, you brace yourself. And he says, he says, and, and the ones I know from Malvern Hill are different. I said, well, yeah, we're a little strange. He said, no, no, no. He said, like, like they, they, they talk about the Word of God. He said, now, I want that for my people. He said, I know some of the men in your church, and, and they, 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 I'm not telling you that they're, they, I know they talk about sports and hunting and all that other stuff. He said, but they, they, they know the Word. They understand the Word, and they talk about it. I want to know what you're doing. I said, man, it is so incredibly boring. We just preach over and over and over again. I said, but when we preach, we preach the Word. And we cling to the Word. But I'm going to tell you something. I was still a little surprised when I got that phone call. And in that place, what did I do? My response was, well, God is doing some amazing things here. You know, Craig, can you help me? And the answer is not, hey, look at Craig. And let me tell you, no, look at what God's done. Yes, praise Him. Praise the Lord. That's what it looks like when we expect. Third, this morning, I want you to trust God is working even when there's opposition. Even in opposition, God was at work through the preaching of Paul and Barnabas. Watch. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and, their, uh, uh, and, and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derby, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding country, period. Now look, somebody's tried to stone you for preaching the gospel and you got out of town. What do you do? I don't know, but I know what Paul and Barnabas did. We keep reading. Verse 7. And there they continued to preach the gospel. What? There they continued to preach the gospel. Look, the, the opposition to the word of God is not always an indication that God has stopped working. As a matter of fact, I would argue that it's never an indication that God has stopped working. 
We can trust that God is at work even when the world doesn't celebrate the message that's being preached and proclaimed. We can celebrate that God's at work even when there's opposition. As a matter of fact, I would argue that sometimes the opposition is a great indicator that we are being faithful to the word of the Lord and faithful to the things that God's called us to. The effectiveness of a message is not always immediately observable. Sometimes in the midst of that opposition, we don't see how God's doing anything through that. Have you ever found yourself in the middle of, 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 of somebody disagreeing with you or arguing, maybe pushing you out the door, and you don't even realize that in the middle of that, that God's actually at work? That God is at work. Watch. Because they mistreated them, tried to stone them, they left to Lystra and Derby, cities of Lyconia and the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. Do you understand that it was because of the opposition that they experienced right there in Iconium that Paul and Barnabas went to Lystra and Derbe? Now I want you to look at the heading for the next passage of Scripture. It's going to give you a head start for next Sunday. Paul and Barnabas at Lystra. What does that mean? That means that there was already a church established here in Iconium. They had raised up a group of believers that could, that could church themselves, right? That they could govern themselves, they could do all the things. And so through that opposition, God pushes them on out the door. And when God got them out the door, they didn't stop preaching. The Bible says that they went somewhere else and they preached the gospel all over again. God used the opposition there to send Paul and Barnabas to the next place so that more people could be evangelized, more churches could be raised up, that the gospel could continue to go forth in power. But sometimes the effectiveness is not immediately observable. Do you think that the preaching that they did there in Iconium was immediately, it was immediately observable that what God was doing? No, no, no. When they got pushed out the door, it was like, oh, well, this didn't go so well. Turns out that God had bigger plans. Folks, I want you to be aware that sometimes you're going to preach or speak or share God's word. And it's going to seem like you're doing so to a block wall. There are going to be times that you're going to share the word, you're going to live faithfully, and it's not going to be appreciated. And as we talk about life group this morning, you might share the word with your children, and they might be 30 years old before they call and thank you for what you did. But we're always playing the long game. We're always playing the long game. Because we're playing the ready? eternal game. That's what we looked at last week. The worldly game has to be short-lived because we've got to hurry up and outdo the Joneses before they get ahead of us. But the eternal game is investing in those things that will last forever. And I don't know if you know much about investments. I'm certainly no financial guru, but I know this. The whole goal for an investment is that it grows over time. Sometimes our investments, our eternal investments, are going to start small, but we're going to watch them flourish. We'll just go back to our parenting scenario from earlier. Parents, if some of you go home today and you look at your children and say, well, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to be committed to our local church. Some of you are going to have children that are going to go, oh, seriously. Some of you are going to have children that are going to buck you. Okay? And in that moment, you're going to make a decision. You're going to decide whether or not you're, you're, you're making an eternal investment. And you're going to trust that the decision you'll make today is going to have great long-term outcomes. You're going to trust that even though you don't immediately observe the response that you would hope for, that correctly teaching and preaching and proclaiming the Word is powerful as it is working. And so you're going to say it, you're going to do it, you're going to live by it, and you're going to trust that over time you're going to see the results that God has promised that His Word will bring about. So trust God's working even when there's opposition. Know that there's, it's not always observable. But then finally, give me this. Always be on the lookout for those eager to hear the gospel. God closed the door at Iconium, but he opened the door in Lystra and Derby. I, I, I want to give some of you a little bit of freedom. Do you have that family member who just doesn't want to hear the word of God from you? You don't have to go to them and keep beating them over the head with the Bible. There are some people that you need to be talking to Jesus about more than talking to them about Jesus. 
And, and I, I don't, that, that's not a, a mean spirited. I'm just saying, like, if, if people are not, if they have zero desire to hear, and you continue to yell at them and scream at them with the Bible, you may do more harm than good. If they don't want to hear about Jesus, then go to Jesus and intercede on their behalf. Book of James says what? The King James Version. The fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much as it is working. That means that our prayers are powerful. Do you have that wayward child that you, you live in regret of every day because you didn't raise them to know Jesus? And they just don't want to hear it from you? Well, for goodness sakes, make sure that heaven's hearing from you even if they won't. But then watch. Always be on the lookout for those eager to hear the gospel. Don't miss the opportunities to share Christ's love and God's hope with others just because somebody didn't want to hear it. Imagine if Paul and Barnabas said, well, they ran us out of town there, so we're just not going to preach anymore. Some of y'all laughed because that sounds ridiculous. But how many of us have, have, have been in that spot, right? Well, I tried to share the gospel. You know, Craig, I did what you said. I took three circles. I learned it. I got my Romans road down pat. And I went to somebody and I said, Jesus loves you. And they said, I don't care. And so I'm just done with the whole thing. How many of you tried to share the gospel with somebody one time and it went bad and you just quit trying altogether? Imagine if Paul and Barnabas encountered a closed door and they're like, oh, well, just walk away and be done with it. What if instead that closed door is just pointing you in a direction of lots more open opportunities? What if... Always be on the lookout for those eager to hear the gospel. They exist. They, they really exist. They really, really exist. Do I need to say it anymore? Do y'all believe me yet? Some of you don't. Do you know why you don't know that there are those people who are eager to hear the gospel? Because you've just not been sharing it. I get emails from people that visit our church and they say things like, it was so wonderful to experience hope. Wow. Wow. It's amazing. I've almost never offered to pray for someone who turned me down. Except for this one time. I offered to pray for a woman and she immediately welled up with tears and said no and just walked off. And I was like, oh, all right. Well, that was interesting. She then came back because she was waiting on me at a restaurant and she said, no one's ever offered to do that for me before. Explain why you did it. Now it turns out she was already a believer. She said, it just blessed my heart that somebody would care enough to do that. She said, would you pray for the people working in the back here? Because they don't know the Lord. And I've been trying to minister to them. Wow. Look for those open doors and watch. When you find them, run through them. When somebody says they want to hear about Jesus, don't put them off. Jump at the opportunity. Hey, would you get coffee with me and we could talk about the Lord? Yes! That's your answer. Yes! I love it when people come sit in my office and they want to talk to me about, about growing in Christ or they want to talk about getting saved. And they'll say, I, I'm sorry I'm taking your time. There's some of y'all in here that experience this from me. I usually get really loud. Again, I'm not yelling. That's just who I am. I say, please stop apologizing. I have to go to budget meetings. I have to deal with people to talk to me about cleaning chandeliers. Well, we don't have chandeliers anymore. I, I have to deal with these things. I get to talk to people about growing in Christ. That's what gets me out of bed in the morning. Please don't apologize because you came here to accept Christ. Please don't apologize because you want to know what it looks like to disciple your children. Please don't. Please come back. And I will cancel other appointments for this one, you know? That's what it looks like. That's what Paul and Barnabas did. They got ran out of town. So they went and found somewhere else to preach. Some of you have been ran out of town. Some of you have been like turned off. You've tried a couple times to talk to somebody about Jesus and it went sour. you got a sister that won't listen. A mom that doesn't care. 
A brother-in-law that just won't listen, won't hear it. Your seatmate, you know, at school or whatever, doesn't want to hear about it anymore. Okay. Jesus, Jesus, I'm praying for them. But then what do you do? Find somebody else. Don't stop. Don't stop. Why? Because preaching matters. And the Word of God goes forth. The gospel of Jesus Christ expands through what? The proclamation of the Word of God. And it's not just the proclamation from here. It's when the proclamation from here is dispersed across an entire community. As you all leave this place and go into all the places where God has you throughout the course of a week. And you carry the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with you. Martin Luther, great reformer, would sometimes sort of boil everything down. The Protestant Reformation. He said everything else can be lost, but the word, the preaching of the word must be retained. The reformers all agreed on this, this principle. That all the marks of a healthy church could be boiled down to one. The right preaching of the word of God. It doesn't mean that other things don't matter within the church. It just means that nothing else matters as much. And if we get the preaching of the word right, we tend to find a way to figure out everything else. So where does that leave you? Are you ready to surrender? Hard question. See, so here's the reality about preaching. And this is why it's hard to preach about preaching. Because preaching is one-sided. It is. And we might as well just be honest about it. It's not like I take questions and y'all come up here and add your part. It's one-sided. But it's important that it's one-sided. And, and preaching being one-sided is, is actually a picture of, of Christ. It's a picture of God's authority. It's a picture of the church. Because preaching being one-sided is this. The Word of God stands over us. The Word of God compels us, controls us, and commands us. And so the responsibility to hear a person preaching the Word is a picture of our responsibility to surrender and submit to the Word of God. And so honest and truly this morning, the question is relatively simple. Are you willing to surrender? Some of you need to surrender your life to Jesus. Some of you belong to Christ, but today you need to actually surrender yourself to His authority. And if I'm being honest, there's some of you that heard that little aside about our parenting decisions. And today needs to be the day that you surrender your parenting choices to Christ rather than to the world. Your kid might not get voted homecoming queen. But what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? As Kevin comes, that little parenting tidbit was an aside but it's actually an appropriate illustration for us to finish with this morning because that's ultimately what preaching is it's a group of people sitting under the proclamation of the word of God and making a decision as to whether or not they're willing to submit and surrender to what God's word says or to live according to their own desires and convictions and so this morning that's my question for you are you willing to surrender, submit choose a word doesn't matter. They all mean the same thing. Are you willing to give up and trust Christ? Some of you need the hope that only He can offer. Some of you need to discover forgiveness for the very first time. Some of you need to pray and ask God to forgive you for the way that you've raised your children. For mercy's sakes, my heart goes out because I know some of you that I've been praying with that today just need to sit there and pray for your wayward kids.
Don't give up. Don't stop. The door may seem closed on your marriage, on your children. Just because you got ran out of Iconium doesn't mean there's not a Lystra and a Derby in your own life. Some of you heard me preach this message. The only thing you have right now is guilt and shame. There's hope. Because there's today and tomorrow. And Christ is always enough. Today. Don't live in your guilt and your shame. Today needs to be the day that you live into the hope and the joy that Christ can bring. So today step out of your Iconium, whatever it is. Today, step into the next place that God would have you to be. And do so in faith and trust, believing that He's enough. Does preaching matter? It absolutely does. And if you've heard this sermon today and it's changed your heart, then for goodness sakes, change yourself right now. Don't wait. Today can be the day that you step out of the mess and walk into the next thing that God has for you. Stand with me as we pray. Lord God in heaven, we give you praise and honor and glory. Be, please, please be at work among us. Move in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us online for worship here at Malvern Hill Baptist Church. You can find out more about us on our website at www.malvernhill.org. There you can find sermons, resources, and tools to help you grow in your relationship with Christ. You can also find a link for online giving there on our website. In addition to getting to know more about us, we really want to get to know more about you. Also on our website...